Welcome everyone to the third webinar of uh, SEMLA 2021. My name is Futkal, I'm Professor at Polytechnic Montreal and uh, I will be moderating our session today. As you may have known by now, if you attend our previous webinar, this year edition, we have prepared six exciting webinars. I think I hope you are enjoying them so far as much as I do. So last week we had the, the opportunity to listen to Professor Schneiderman talking about the human HCI AI. We had on Tuesday an exciting talk by Nisha Lagala talking about how we can empower um, non-professional with leveraging the power of, of AI to solve different tasks. And today we will have uh, Vera. It's my distinct honor to introduce Vera today. We'll be talking about the explainable AI, which is a very, very exciting topic, it's a very timely topic. And we have three more exciting webinars coming ahead, one by Daniel and Arif. They will be talking about the release of machine learning based systems. And then we will have a webinar by Inyo from Microsoft talking about AI apps. And another webinar by Grace for Carnegie from Carnegie Mellon, which will be, be talking about the architecture, how we can architect AI-based system. So today, in today's webinar, it's on human-centered explainable AI. And our speaker of the day is Vera Liao from IBM Watson. So Vera is an expert in working at the intersection of software engineer, human computer interactions. She has done a lot of pioneer work in this area, and she will be talking about experimental AI conversational agents with us today. So without further notice, I will let Vera, but maybe before I get that, some practicality. As for the previous webinar, you can ask questions in the QA, and I will be relaying the questions to, to Vera, and she will be answering the question live. You can also vote on the questions that are posted on the QA, so the most popular question maybe ask us, and I will also manage to ensure that we have a diversity in the different topics that are, that I asked on the QA so that we can have a very exciting discussion. Okay, that's it for the logistic and uh, Vera, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I, let me start by sharing my screen. I hope everyone can now see my slides. Yes. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks uh, to the organizers for inviting me here and putting together such an amazing event. Uh, I want to share some work that my colleague and I at IBM Research have been doing on the topic of a human centered explainable AI. Um, I want to say a few things to situate the work we do. So uh, I am a human computer interaction HCI researcher. Uh, I work under this area of trusted AI. Most of my research colleagues are AI researchers. They work on developing new AI algorithms. Uh, and one line of work we do is to work together to put out these open source toolkits on the topic related to we call trustworthy AI. Some people use the term responsible AI, uh, including explainability, fairness, robustness, uh, fact sheets related to AI documentation and governance. Uh, I'm very excited to announce we had a new one last week released on uh, uncertainty quantification. So this uh, 360 series of toolkits, uh, for one, they are uh, open source toolkits, uh, collaborate that make state of the art technique uh, developed in the academic world more accessible to practitioner, to data scientists, product team. We also always try to include educational resources on this topic and try to cultivate a community. Yeah, so check them out. Hopefully you will find them useful for your own work. Uh, so the one I spent significant time was the first one on explainability that was 2019 and the recent one on uh, uncertainty. 
And as a HCI researcher, I often see the release of the toolkits as the beginning, not the end of my work. Uh, I'm interested in how do we help practitioners to make better use of this kind of toolkits uh, to build uh, trustworthy, responsible AI application, good user experience. And often say the work we do uh, is bridging work to bridge toolbox of algorithms into toolbox of design materials. Uh, hopefully by the end of my talk, you have some idea how we do this bridging work uh, using explainability as a test bed. So what is explainable AI? Uh, I think there is uh, there are two definitions going around. Um, AI researchers are often adopting the relatively narrower definition, which are uh, techniques that make an AI model's decision understandable by people. So the keywords here is the decision process. But if you talk to practitioners, uh, this word is often used more liberally. So to have a holistic understanding, users might also be interested in uh, explanation about the data, system function, performance. Uh, so AI is not just machine learning, but our work focuses on uh, supervised machine learning. Um, um, given that supervised machine learning is still one of the most popular AI technology. So you might have heard the term explainable AI in academia, industry, even popular press. Uh, it's also in the legislation, right? GDPR is the European law that require people to have rights to explanation uh, whenever there is automated decision system. Uh, one of the reason is, of course, AI is being increasingly used everywhere, including high stake contacts like healthcare, finance, employment, even criminal justice system. So in those contexts, if the system does not work reliably, the outcome can be disastrous. And also users tend to be more cautious, right? If you would hand them a black box model, I tend to use the term opaque box model, uh, they may not feel comfortable using it. So there's also the adoption and user trust issue. Uh, but one of the reasons we're, we're seeing such an uh, active uh, research field every year, hundreds, if not more paper published on it, is because in the present time, um, there is a explainability performance trade-off, at least in the average setting of training machine learning model. Uh, on the one end, we have uh, models that are relatively easy to understand, like uh, linear model, decision tree, rule-based model, but they tend to not perform that well. Uh, on the other end, we have very popular high-performing model, like those use deep learning uh, or ensemble model. Uh, they perform really well, but they tend to be complex and opaque. They don't necessarily follow a human understandable rationale, even you show the rationale to people. So with that challenge, uh, the field uh, is trying to develop new technique to tackle that challenge. And there are so many different techniques, but they generally fall into two camps. Uh, one is what we call developing directly explainable model. Uh, and the newer work is also trying to break this trade off a bit uh, to develop more sophisticated rule based model or linear model um, that perform better than a simple model, but still preserve the property of being relatively easy to understand. And on the other side, we have what we call a post hoc explainability meaning that uh, you already choose to use an opaque box model, like a deep neural network or ensemble. Uh, you need a separate technique or algorithm to generate explanation for them. That's why we call it a post hoc. Uh, to just give you one example, this is one of the most popular explainability algorithm called the line. Uh, it's a post hoc algorithm. What it does is uh, it will treat this complex model as an opaque box and it will explain its the decision. So you just look at the input and output of this decision and also sample the neighboring instance. And with that, uh, to build a simpler model, a linear model in the local region and use the simpler model's rationale to explain the complex model uh, in the local region. 
So it's also very popular because it is model agnostic. Whatever model you are using, you can plug in this algorithm to generate explanation. Uh, the explanation is what we call a uh, local feature contribution. Uh, is to explain this particular prediction by highlighting we, what feature of this instance contributed to this prediction. For example, if you are using tabular data, you can visualize the contribution of different feature, which feature has the highest contribution. If you're using image data, you can highlight uh, super pixel or patches of the image and say, this is why uh, the model think there is a cat. Uh, for text data, you can highlight keywords and uh, justify that this is why the document is predicted into this label. So Lime is just one example. Uh, there are many other different kinds of algorithms that uh, can explain the model at a global level, give you an overview of the general logic. Uh, Lime is an example of what we call a local explanation, explain particular decision. And another category is called uh, inspecting counterfactual. I will give example in later slides generally is to tell you uh, how this current instance should change to get a different prediction. So the technical landscape is not the focus of this talk, uh, but if you're interested, I encourage you to check out this course we taught at Kai. We posted our course material. And in that talk, uh, I gave an overview of different algorithm, how the output might look like. But today I want to focus more on the HCI design side of research. So there are a uh, growing uh, connection of XAI technique, uh, a lot in the literature. Uh, also a growing set of them are making their way into practitioners, right? Data scientists, AI products by way of uh, open source toolkits. Uh, so IBM has AX360, uh, would a big company have their own version? There's also some startups. So now practitioner has access to this toolbox. They're eager to take up the technique and build XAI system. Uh, I think we're really at the edge of going to see a real world XAI system. And this system may work in many different domains and serve many different user group. Uh, but there is a sobering question of uh, putting out this toolbox. Uh, how will practitioner use them? Will practitioner use them at all? Um, at present time, we actually know very little about how users actually interact with AI explanation and how do we design the user experience. So with that kind of motivation, I often see the HCI work we do as in this in-between space of having this toolbox of XAI technique and use them to build XAI user experience. And we also hope our work can help practitioner also work in this in-between space. And a particular role we're looking at is uh, designers, broadly defined uh, user experience researcher, UI designer. So their uh, work is also to uh, take this algorithm and build the right user experience. And for practitioner, uh, whenever they have this kind of toolbox, they need to answer two questions. One is how to select how to select the most appropriate technique for a given application, user group, even interaction. And the second is how to translate. It's often not ideal to just show user the raw output of an algorithm. So how do we translate a model's rationale into user's term? Um, so to answer those two questions, we do two lines of uh, research. Uh, one is we study the design practice, understand this design space of XAI, and try to help uh, develop design methods. And in another thread, uh, we do this selection and translation work ourselves. So we uh, looked into different XAI use case, we designed a system, we studied the user interaction. 
And by doing work in this in-between space, we also hope to bring real world insights back into the technical AI community. Uh, one is to contextualize XAI algorithm, what kind of place they might work, where they may fall short, and also to inform where are the gaps and opportunity for new algorithmic research. So I want to start with the second thread, uh, which is uh, our HCI research with different XCI use case. Uh, my goal here is to give you an overview what are some important use case when we think about explainable AI and how the explanation might look like. Uh, today, I will not delve into the research detail, but I will provide a reference for you to dig deeper. Um, I will leave some time later for a question and answer, but if you have a burning question, feel free to uh, interrupt me. So there are different ways to think about what are some XAI use cases. Um, and one lens we look into is this AI life cycle, how an AI model is developed, how it's used, and we also separate them into the development side and the deployment side. So my colleague and I and our interns, we have looked into various kind of uh, use case in this whole AI life cycle. Today, I want to pick a few of them, uh, which are also commonly talk about use case. Uh, the first use case uh, is also an area we begin to see some real world application first is to use explanation to support uh, model debugging and selection. And here the user group are data scientists. Uh, so without delving into too much detail, uh, here are some examples of our work of recent HCI work uh, that develop this kind of model debugging or selection interfaces. Uh, the general motivation is that currently uh, when data scientists build machine learning model, they just look at uh, the performance metrics. But we want them to go a step further. We want them to be able to actually inspect the model behavior and that help to make sure the model will behave as expected in the deployment context. Also guide them to see where are the problem, what is the right debugging strategy. Um, a common property of this kind of application interface is that they often leverage multiple kinds of explanation to enable data scientists to inspect a model at multiple levels, right? So data scientists might be interested in a high level, how the model weighs different features. Uh, they might want to zoom into a particular input space or subset of data and look at how the model work there. They might also be interested in particular instance, for example, uh, instance where the model would make a wrong tick prediction. These interfaces also tend to be relatively complex. Visualization is often used also because this, this user group are well adapted for using this kind of interface uh, using visualization. And another use case people commonly talk about uh, with explanation is to help end users uh, to make better decision. Uh, right now, I would say most machine learning system fall into the category of decision support system. So there will always be a human decision maker. The AI will give a recommendation uh, that will support their decision, but the decision maker will make it ultimate call. So uh, explanation is useful in this context. Uh, one reason is explanation can give additional information to help them make more informed decisions, also take better actions. Uh, one example is, uh, so IBM has this tool called uh, Watson Supply Chain. So there's an AI behind to tell uh, supply chain management people, this delivery is expected to be delayed. Uh, so we learned from our designer that users are not satisfied just seeing a score. They really want to know the explanation or the reason, and that will determine their follow-up action. Uh, is it because of weather reason they cannot do anything about it, or is somewhere that they can make a phone call? So this additional information to help them make take action. Another reason uh, people commonly consider uh, explanation is useful 
is to help people do trust calibration at a prediction level, meaning that uh, knowing when I can trust the AI, when I cannot. Uh, if you have an explanation, you can see a particular prediction seem to be problematic, the rationale, and the decision maker might be able to uh, take more caution. So that is the kind of hope, uh, but I also want to point out that uh, the empirical results is not as optimistic. Uh, our recent paper and some Kai paper will have this pretty uh, robust observation that explanation can need to unwarranted trust even when user should not, at least when using this uh, more simplistic feature contribution kind of explanation. So we had this controlled uh, user experiment, uh, which we're using this income prediction data set. Um, and we use this simple visualization just show for this particular person, uh, what feature of this person uh, lead me to believe that he will be a high or low income person. We basically we find that when uh, when the model is has low confidence, when people should be cautious, not relying on model, showing this explanation versus not showing explanation actually lead people to more likely to rely on the model, which uh, overall somewhat reduce this human performance. Uh, so the lesson here, why is uh, when we design explanation, we need to uh, test it, whether user uh, can perceive it in the right way, whether there are biases, uh, because theoretically, this kind of explanation can alert people. Uh, this is ambivalent decision if you look at the contribution bar. Uh, but uh, user are not looking them carefully. Instead, they seem to associate explanation means the model is competent. Uh, and another lesson is maybe beyond explanation, we need to resort to other approach to alert people when the model uh, has low confidence. And that is exactly the motivation for us to develop uh, the recent uh, toolkits on uncertainty quantification. So check that out. Um, and the last use case people commonly talk about is that explanation can enable model auditing, whether for regulatory body or people being impacted. And one reason is to audit whether the model has biases or fairness issue. So fair ML is itself a huge active uh, research area. Uh, there are many diff different definition of fairness. But the general uh, idea is that, so machine learning model is to learn pattern from historical data and disparity is a given. But if this disparity put certain unprivileged group at a systematic or disadvantage, whether it's racial group, gender, age, disability, uh, this should be considered unfair, biased, or even illegal in certain contexts. So the most prominent uh, example of this fairness problem is campus. So campus is an ML system used by parts of the criminal justice system in the United States. Uh, what it does is to make a recidivism prediction that a defendant is likely or unlikely to reoffend. And judges can use that information in sentence decision, for example, deciding whether to post bail, how much to post bail. But the problem is that uh, the model is trained in historical data, and we know it's a fact that our criminal justice system, policing system, exhibit certain biases. And the learned model will exhibit the same kind of bias. For example, if you show two defendants have similar profile but different race, the model can give different prediction. And this is a um, um, high profile case made public aware by a group of activists and also really mark a lot of discussion around the fairness of AI. And you are seeing that the AI community are uh, producing a lot of work in the past five years. Uh, most of the technical work focused on uh, how do we measure bias uh, and how do we de-bias the model. But the common consensus is also we should not automate this process. Uh, we need to have human in the loop to uh, inspect the model and see whether it has fairness problem, what definition of fairness, uh, which feature has fairness, and choose the right intervention, the right de-biasing technique.
So that's where we see this intersection between fairness and explainability. Uh, explainability can be used as interface to enable a regulator or impacted group to scrutinize whether model has discrimination. Uh, without getting into the study details, we had this paper with our intern Jonathan Dodge uh, in 2019. Uh, we took the campus data set, we kind of replicate this model, um, and then we generate four kinds of popular types of explanation. And we conducted user study to see whether this explanation can help people correctly judge the model fairness. We had ground truth that different versions of the model have different level of fairness. Um, so generally we find that what this explanation helps, but through different, slightly different mechanism. So on the top uh, left, we have what's called contrastive explanation is a form of uh, counterfactual, inspecting counterfactual, right? The idea is to tell you uh, which feature if I perturb or change, implying minimum change, will get the model to make a different prediction. And here it really gets into this individual fairness notion that uh, two people are treated differently just because they have different races. And another example is this example-based explanation. Uh, so without getting into the model rationale, uh, we use similar example that had similar profile with this defendant and has similar outcome. Uh, but example-based explanation can alert people this is an ambivalent decision, right? Only 60% of them had a similar outcome. So that alert people to look into, is this a fair decision? At the bottom, we have two kinds of explanation we call uh, global explanation because this give an overview of how the model make decision in general. Uh, so feature importance highlight how the model weighs different feature and data distribution give you an idea what is the pattern in the training data. And this gave people an overview of the group fairness, for example, whether the model weighs certain racial group differently or the, data, or the training data itself is unfair. So working across this different use case, uh, there are a few lessons we learned I want to share. Uh, why is uh, not surprising me, there's no one faithful solution, different application, different user group, many different kinds of explanation. And real world XAI system often needs multiple types of explanation, uh, but, the, uh, but the challenge is to anticipate when and where user want, what kind of explanation. Uh, we also need to be aware that the potential risk of giving explanation, right? Uh, that can be unwarranted trust. Uh, you can also create distraction or information overload. In some of our work, we also highlight that there is a disparate effect that when you show explanation, right? One group of user, uh, maybe uh, ML experts, they have the capability to make sense of the uh, explanation. Well, another group of user, they could not. And these two group will have different user experience, even different level of trust in AI. And the last two points are, are related. Uh, we see that there's a huge underdeveloped translation design space, meaning that the work does not stop at picking the right algorithm. There are still a lot of design decision to be made uh, in terms of how do you show the explanation to user. Uh, one example that the translation design is challenging is because users' information needs to achieve understanding can go beyond uh, algorithmic explanation. And that goes to a fundamental challenge with XAI is that understanding lies in the recipient. Just by making a model and algorithm transparent, does not guarantee that people can make sense of it. Uh, some even some even criticize the GDPR law that it has these words meaningful, uh, but it's under specified because meaningfulness is up to the recipient. 
So with that, we often encourage our designer to center their analysis on users' information needs to achieve understanding rather than what is a good technique, what makes the algorithm transparent. By doing that, you will quickly realize that there are other kinds of information with knowledge gap, right? Uh, user might need to first understand how AI work in general before they can make sense of explanation or they may have a domain knowledge gap. They need to first understand what a feature mean uh, in this domain before they can understand explanation. Our recent work also highlight that a user might also need to make sense of this social organizational context of this AI system, especially given that a consequential AI system are often deeply embedded in certain organizational contexts. Uh, so user also need to uh, make sense of that and understanding is socially situated. So we had this Kai paper came out last month uh, we propose to expand uh, the design and conceptual space of explainability to also make transparent this social organizational context around an AI system. And one way to do so, we propose very much inspired by HCI, CSW work, is to record and present past users' interaction with AI and their reasoning with AI decision. And we had an empirical study to show there are many benefits of showing other people's reasoning uh, to help people make sense of the AI, make better decision, and also just a good organizational practice to hold both people and AI system accountable. Uh, this is also a good place to switch to the second thread. Um, I think that the design is difficult, it's a challenge, uh, the fundamentally, the reason is that there are many different kinds of user objectives for people to seek explanation. Uh, recent work also start to summarize what are the prototypical user group to seek explanation. But even that, I think the granularity is not enough. If you think about decision maker in the healthcare domain versus in a finance domain, they have different AI knowledge, they have different needs, different workflow. So at the end of the day, uh, I think um, even though having use case specific prototype or design guidelines useful, at the end of the day, we need to do user centered design, we need to understand the nuances of user needs and the nuances of their uh, work context. So that motivated us to uh, do the, the other thread of research is to look into the design practice. So it started with an interview study I did in 2019. Um, I interviewed 20 designers working across 16 uh, AI products within IBM. Um, this is also right after we released the AX360 toolkit and I was interested in uh, what is this design space? Uh, a bit forward looking given that it's an emerging technical space and also what are some design challenges? Uh, very quickly, we run into this challenge, right? We want to talk to our designers, uh, but this is a technical space that they're not quite in there yet. Uh, the designers might not be familiar with different XAI algorithms. There's no shared framework to even talk about it. So we decided to create a study probe, uh, which means a concrete representation to ground our discussion. Uh, we create uh, algorithm-informed um, XAI questions. Uh, it is based on the following assumption. Uh, the first assumption, which I kind of foreshadowed you with the little blurb you saw before, uh, user needs for explainability. What kind of explanation they need can be represented by what kind of questions they ask. A how question, a why question, or what if question will require different kinds of explanation. We also assume that uh, a question can be addressed by one or multiple XAI method. For example, uh, this local feature contribution can answer a why question. And a method can be implemented by one or multiple algorithm, right? Local contribution 
uh, can be implemented by LIME, it can also be implemented by other algorithm. They may differ in computational property, but from users point of view, we want to stay at a granularity of XI method. What is the form of the explanation? So with that in mind, we started with a literature survey. We arrive at this list of explanation method and we map them to what is the prototypical question this explanation can answer. And we're taking this broader view of uh, explainability. So we also added uh, three categories that related to model facts rather than the decision process, uh, including the data, uh, the output, and also the performance. So we had these nine categories of question. We created this question card. We brought that to our designers. We asked them to first tell us this AI system you have worked on. And before showing them cards, we'll ask them, what are some common questions your user have for understanding the AI? Now we walk them through each card. We discuss, uh, do this question apply? Uh, did we miss anything? So the middle two step, what we're essentially doing is quote unquote, uh, designer sourcing common questions people have for understanding AI. And one contribution we try to make uh, in, in this work is we, by analyzing those questions, we develop XAI question bank. Um, it's an extendable repository of common questions people have for understanding AI. So it represents this common space of uh, explainability needs. We're also organizing them in this nine different category, which have correspondence to uh, explanation methods or technique to answer the question. I will come back to discuss how we may use this question bank. I want to first also share uh, what are the design challenges we learn from this work. Um, the first design challenge, perhaps not surprising at this point, is there's a huge variability. A uh, user will ask different kinds of questions for different application, different usage points. Uh, and one fundamental reason is that people are seeking explanation for different objectives. So explanation is to support understanding, but understanding itself is rarely the end goal. Uh, the end goal is to, uh, and we summarize in the paper, this list of common objective or common end goal people seek explanation for, uh, including to gain insights for the decision, uh, to appropriately evaluate AI's capability, uh, to adapt usage or control, learn about the domain, improve the model, and there's also legal and ethical compliance. Um, another challenge we saw is that uh, designers struggle with this gaps between algorithmic output of explanation and human desired explanation. Uh, and one literature, one paper I recommend everyone to read is this Tim Miller's paper. Uh, he surveys social science literature and summarized what are some fundamental property in human explanation? And that helps us to see uh, where are the gaps in current uh, techniques. And we see a lot of resonance with that paper in our interview. For example, uh, human explanations are selective. When I explain my behavior, I'm not giving you the whole causal chain. I'm going to pick uh, courses that I believe either uh, the more informative you don't know, or I believe the most persuasive. So the, the selection part is currently still part of the design decision rather than that we can achieve just by an algorithm. And there are other human explanation property, uh, including being contrastive, interactive, uh, tailored for the recipients uh, that are hardly achievable through uh, algorithm today. Uh, but we also see some translation design effort to close the gap. For example, uh, it's common for designer to observe how domain experts explain a domain and try to mimic both the format and the terminology they use. And what this work really opened my eyes was so this uh, process-oriented challenge uh, for designers to advocate for explainability feature. 
Uh, one is that uh, designers or practitioner in general, they have challenge navigating this technical space, given that it's still an emerging space. Uh, but challenge here is also they need to find the right pairing between what's right for the user and what is feasible for the model for the algorithm. Uh, and to do so, they also need to get buy-in from data scientists slash AI engineer because the AI engineers are people burdened with doing the extra implementation. Um, but the problem is sometimes design can come too late. Um, the model is already built. And also there are communication barriers, a, a lack of shared workflow that really hinders getting buy-in from AI engineer and ultimately uh, hinders the product team to invest in or prioritize explainability features. So in the paper, we did uh, two sets of analysis. One is uh, we look into in a real world use case, why these different categories of question or ask and why try to derive high level guideline in terms of how to address these different categories of explainability. Uh, we also did a gap analysis looking at what are the question emerged in the interview that was not in our original question and that helped us to see where are the technical gaps and where are the opportunity for new algorithmic work? Uh, without getting into detail, these are in the paper, but I want to spend the rest of my talk uh, to talk about uh, what came out of this work is a user-centered design process to think about explainability uh, that we're currently uh, adopting it uh, within IBM. It's going to be incorporated in our uh, standard design framework to think about um, explainable AI. So to tackle those three challenge I discussed, uh, we propose this user-centered design process to identify interaction specific user needs to find the right pairing of technique to iterative design and evaluation all grounded in an understanding of what kind of questions user have. So we call it question driven XAI design. Uh, it's also our attempt to bring designers and AI engineers to work closer to develop shared design vision first and use that to drive uh, technical development, which I firmly believe is the key to uh, put user centers, put user at the center and have responsible AI system. So um, here we can use the XAI question bank as a checklist to identify for a particular application which question apply. And another set of work we did is to do this mapping of, we take these uh, common categories in the uh, question bank and we map them to what are some XAI technique and algorithm that can answer this question. We focus on algorithms that are available in current open source toolkits. I can share the slides. So all this has URL links for you to go directly to the open source toolkits to look into the technical detail and speed up the implementation. And by doing the mapping, we derive a set of design guidelines in the middle, how to explain to answer this question, which are grounded in the technical availability. And there are two high level idea here. One is that uh, we are using user question as a way to reframe the technical space instead of using a data science kind of taxonomy. We think about what kind of user question this different technique can answer. And that helps also connect directly to the output of user research. And another idea is to make a question as a boundary object to support designer and engineer to brainstorm, to problem solving, where the designer have a clear understanding of what are the user requirements behind the question, and the data scientists can understand the detail of the, of the technique of the model. So I have this uh, um, working paper archive on my website to describe this design process. But here I want to quickly use a use case where we actually practice this design process to walk you through uh, this method. Uh, 
So this is a use case uh, I actually participated last year, um, working with Watson Health and other uh, researchers. We're trying to develop an AI for healthcare adverse event prediction. So the AI can give a prediction of patient's risk of unplanned hospitalization. So doctor can identify who are the high risk patient and better manage their care. And from the very beginning, we recognize that explainability should be the core part of the user experience because doctor will not be uh, satisfied by just seeing a risk score. They want to understand the reason so that they can better manage the care. So the first step is to identify user question. And this can be just a lightweight exercise in the broader user research you are doing. Uh, so for that project, we started with uh, interviewing clinicians um, and we start by asking them how they are currently doing risk management of patients and what can the AI do in this task? Uh, so work with them, we define this task description, which is an AI to help them assess the risk and identify high risk patient. And at this point, we ask the following question. We ask them, uh, what are the, some questions you have if we have such an AI system? What are the questions that AI needs to answer to be useful and trustworthy? So we ask them uh, to every doctor we interviewed, we also further probe on what are the intention and expectation around this question. Uh, why did you ask that question? What would be a good answer look like? What should a good answer do? For example, a uh, doctor might ask, uh, what are the main risk factor for this person? Uh, the reason he's asking this because they want to understand, better understand the patient, uh, discover non-obvious uh, factors about this patient. So you collect these two sets of data, the question they have, and this intention and expectation around the question. And the second step is to analyze the question and you want to produce two sets of outcome. One is you want to uh, cluster the question. Uh, for example, uh, all of the doctor asked about this why question. Why is this patient predicted high risk? Uh, some also ask how to be that? What can I do to reduce this predicted risk? They also ask about performance data, uh, the range of output, what can I do with the output? Uh, here you also can use the question bank as a way to guide your analysis. And we also encourage you to look at the prioritization, right? How many people ask the question? If a question is commonly asked, that you should prioritize addressing that question. And you also want to analyze that intention and expectation behind. Uh, and with that work, we cluster these this comments and we identify you for user requirements, including uh, discover new information about the patients, determine the effective next step. So these are the user requirements that should guide the design and evaluation of uh, your user experience. And the third step is where designers and data scientists should sit down and look at uh, the prioritized questions and trying to identify what are some candidate technical solution to answer those questions. And we encourage you to use this mapping chart to get that discussion. For example, looking at the why question, uh, there are different algorithms that can generate uh, this explanation uh, and data scientists can look into which one is applicable to my particular model. And once you have that set of candidate technique, uh, the last step is to do the design. Meanwhile, data scientists can proceed with the implementation with confidence. Uh, and also uh, emphasize that the design should be iterative. You create a version of design, you look into whether this design addressed those user requirements you identified in earlier stage. And if not, you want to improve the design iteratively and fill the gaps. So very quickly, uh, this is the design we created for that use case that has a correspondence to the user question we gathered in the beginning. Right. So again, this is an AI system that does risk prediction. Uh, we have this uh, future contribution panel 
uh, which is to answer this why question, what feature of this patient contributed to uh, his prediction, why he's a low risk patient. We also have this action impact panel, which is to answer how to be that, what action I can take, uh, which feature I should focus on eliminate the risk factor to improve the predicted risk. Uh, we also find it's really useful this approach to guide uh, looking into what aspects of the model facts the people is interested, right? We have this pop-up window for explaining the data. Uh, so the doctor's question was really helpful for us to see uh, what parts of the data, what kind of facts about the data they're interested, they're interested in whether the data aligns with their patients. So we provide this pop-up window showing the distribution of key population and also what is the source of the training data. So yeah, so uh, reaching to the end of my talk, I want to uh, also give this concluding remark of how we do this bridging work from uh, toolbox of XA algorithm to toolbox of design material. I think there are three principles we follow. One is that uh, we want it to be human-centered, and I believe human-centered is not just about design and evaluate with the user. We need to take a fundamental shift of view to reframe the technical space, uh, contextualize the algorithm in terms of what human value needs they serve, and that will also encourage a practitioner to foreground users instead of technical affordance. We also need to think outside the box, center our analysis on user needs, and that will also help us to see where this toolbox falls short. And second is we want to be responsible. Uh, we want to carefully examine the breakdown, the limitation of the tools and carefully label this toolbox and also enable user-centered design to drive the choices from this technical toolbox. And lastly, we want things to be actionable. Uh, we want to support a practitioner working in the process, practitioner who want to create responsible AI, so create a design assets or methods that they can readily use. And lastly, I also want to say that explainability is important, but it should not be the right herring that distracts us from other more important issue to create a human center and responsible AI uh, ecosystem. Uh, the example I like to use is you don't need to understand how plane work, but you will choose to take a flight because there is a huge ecosystem to make sure uh, the fly the plane work properly and you can trust it. Uh, so some of you probably have attended Ben Schleiderman's talk and he discussed a lot of perhaps more important issues beyond explainability, including the safety culture, uh, the oversight, the legislation. Um, so explainability is important, but we also need to pay attention to all those factors around. And with that, I'd like to thank my uh, collaborator and thanks. Uh, thank you for um, having your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much for a very, very, very interesting talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, please chat, type your question in the QA if you have any. And uh, we have one here, I guess, which is related to somehow uncertain. So one assumption behind what you have presented is that the explanation that you get through the different techniques, it somehow reliable, mm -hmm. right? So my question is, from your experiment, your experience, with these case studies, from the different questions that you identify as critical and essential for good explanation on the user's perspective, how often were the techniques, the automatic techniques able to provide reliable mm -hmm. answers mm -hmm. to these questions, right? Yeah. Second, in, in some cases, if I remember you mapping, for each question you had different alternatives, right? You could use different variety of techniques to try to gain insight with respect to that question which raised the question of consistency, right? Did you observe any consistency in the explanation provided by the different techniques? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. how does roughly the, I would say the epistemic uncertainty that we have on the modeling translate mm -hmm. in these explanations and how, how should we manage this around, right? right and how, right. 
Yeah, very, very good question. I will start by addressing the first question, but I think you, some of the answer will kind of cover the second question as well. Uh, yeah, thanks for bringing this uncertainty of uh, explanation. I think there's also two sides of uncertainty. Uh, one is uh, similar to how people perceive uncertainty, there is a perception uncertainty, right? Just by showing people how the feature, how the model works, does not necessarily guarantee everyone will perceive it without bias or even carefully examine it. And that's, I think, is also a fundamental challenge with explanation. As I mentioned, uh, some of the empirical study, we just find that uh, especially people who don't have this quote unquote ideal profile of capability or motivation, they might just not be able to uh, make sense of the explanation. So first of all, you need to test with the user, have an understanding for your user, can they perceive uh, it in an uh, accurate way. And another thing is we cannot resort to explainability as a, as a software solution, right? There are other things, as we say, like how do we guarantee this is to be trustworthy? Beyond explainability, we need to, we need to uh, look into. We cannot uh, count on that every user will make perfect sense of explanation as a way to build trust or use the AI. And another side of uncertainty, which is really interesting, and I think we might need also some public education part is, especially post hoc explainability, it can be unfaithful to the original model's decision. Uh, it's almost inevitable uh, if you are using approximation method. Right. Um, we have some metrics in the X360 toolkit and in the literature that measure the faithfulness, some people call fidelity. So that gave you an idea if you have multiple choice of technique, which one is probably more, more faithful. Um, but again, I think I think it's 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 inevitable. Um, there are some argument that in certain domain you should just avoid using post hoc technique altogether. Choose a directly explainable model, even with some sacrifice of uh, performance, so that can at least get rid of that part of uncertainty. But my personal view is also, I think post hoc explainability has its place, right? First is sometimes for practitioner, they just don't have access to the underlying algorithm. They're using off the shelf solutions, so they have to use post hoc technique. And also, uh, I also want to point out uh, from a practical point of view, uh, it's just easier sometimes to build a opaque box model. You don't need to do a lot of uh, feature engineering work. So from practical point, you might also choose to do that. So I still think post hoc technique has its place, but we need to have this public education. They don't necessarily uh, faithful always, and we need to be cautious and also through other measure to make sure the model work properly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. A great answer. We have another question from Professor Hang, which is a bit related to the case study that you had with Doctor. His point is: uh, Is AI explanation similar to how doctors explain disease drugs with patients? Mm -hmm. Two similar things. We don't hear a clear understanding of human. We, we don't still have a clear understanding of human body. We don't have a clear understanding of AI either, right? So the outcome is uncertain, and his point is can or have you learned from how doctor explain things mm -hmm. that they used to improve? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that's also a, a very interesting observation we, we learn from a designer to have this effort of starting with learning about how human expands. Uh, one thing I do want to say is like, of course, there are a lot of gaps in terms of um, how human explain what an algorithm can achieve. Uh, also, human explanation is broader than just making my reasoning chain transparent, right? Uh, sometimes we expand by additional evidence to justify my decision. And that's, that's a place I think also we can draw inspiration as a designer or developing new technique. Uh, like one example we learned from our, our designer is in the, also in the medical domain, 
Uh, so medical doctor, they don't necessarily get into how I reached this decision. Instead, they will cite additional reference or recent study that justify this, this decision. So they, they, they kind of incorporate that thinking into the design as well. So instead of getting into how this algorithm work, instead of they use additional feature to provide supporting evidence and also like both pros and cons, both positive and negative evidence to also help people to have more unbiased decisions. So I think that's another, another view that we can draw inspiration from how human explain, which can be broader than algorithmic transparency. Thanks for that question. We have a related question on that that just popped up on the, on the QA. Okay. There's only a study where user were given explanation. Do you think, user relies sometimes too heavily on it like are there any sector where human should not be referenced perhaps should we use less human intervention more more ai i think it's it's about the balance like um can you repeat I, I'm, I'm missing the part is it talking about human explanation or human? yeah it's a do you think that some domain should have reduced explainability roughly oh. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, that's a great question. Uh, we put a lot of thought into that. Uh, the, the general answer I like to formalize it is explainability is needed first when there is understanding gap and there is a need for fill this understanding gap to support some kind of end goal. Sometimes you don't have an understanding gap. User have been using a system, they know it well, and then you don't need explainability. And sometimes uh, you, you don't need the understanding to support and go, right? Again, this uh, example of uh, you're taking a plane, you can trust the plane without understanding it. Then in those kind of situations, you, you don't need explainability. Uh, and then sometimes there's a trade-off also, right? If you want to achieve the end goal, you can go through uh, understanding, you can go through other routes. If understanding reading explanation is more costly, you might choose uh, another route. So. Uh, thinking about understanding and and voice is often how I formalize this problem. Yeah, great, great question. Thank you. I have another one, if you yes. if you permit, related to adversary, right? So recently, I think a year or two years ago, there was this paper on fair washing, right, where people actually demonstrate how you can use explanation to kind of pretend fairness in the model, right? So in a sense, you have bias in the models. Mm -hmm. but you cannot try to generate explanation that pretends otherwise. How do you see this type of approach, or this type of behavior impacting AI industrialization going forward? And what should be done on the explainability front to kind of prevent this type of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thing happening? <laughs> Right. I don't, I don't, I don't personally work in this intersection. I feel like I need to know more about adversarial attack to answer this question. But, but I think, again, like explanation is probably the interface for people to inspect what is really exactly happening. Um, so maybe with adversarial example, having explanation can help people better understand why that is happening and that helps people improve the model. Uh, so yeah, that's my uninformed answer. I'd be happy to discuss <laughs> what's yeah, your yeah. thought along that line. Yeah, yeah thank yeah, you. Yeah. It's it's an interesting topic. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe one we're going over time. Maybe one one last that's coming from it from the chat. It's the technical. What's the difference between interpretability and explainability? Oof, <laughs> I, feel, <laughs> I need to count how many uh, times I got that question. Um, so in the literature, I think usually interpretability is considered a little bit narrower than explainability, but again, different papers cite different definition, uh, but narrow in a sense, I think two ways. One is some people uh, only using interpretability to refer to directly explainable, make the model you show yet directly that's ex uh, explainable, uh, exclude the post hoc explainability part um, because that's kind of a justification approximation approach. Another view that's narrower is also some people think uh, inter explainability has a more of a proactive uh, uh, attributes. So it's not just about making the model transparent, but also the system needs to uh, answer your question, give supportive information. So everything that helps people 
um, understand it. So that's 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 general. That's generally my view. But I've also seen uh, other literature go completely reverse. Think interpretability is broader than explainability. Um, but that's that's my view. But I would say practitioner often just use the two term quite interchangeably. I think it just yeah, I think explainability is broader. Actually. It's, yeah, <laughs> you just don't need to interpret the outcome of the model, but you need to be able to explain how how the model. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe one last question. I keep <laughs> they, they are coming. Up. <laughs> no problem. Okay. So there is an anonymous question. Could the model use counterfactual checking to detect inherent bias in training data? It's a bit more technical. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I think so. I, I think we show that contrastive explanation part. Uh, it's definitely a way for people to identify there is a fairness problem, and then you can get into what is what is the training problem. So using counterfactual explanation uh, is a, is actually a pretty common approach for people to test whether there's fairness. There's actually a particular definition called a counterfactual uh, fairness, and there are metrics to also directly measure instead of having human in the loop to examine. Uh, whether there is counterfactual fairness problem. If you Google that term, you will, you'll find that paper. Yeah, thanks for the question. All right, that's, uh, I think that's fit for an end. Thank you very much for a very exciting talk. Thank you everyone. Uh, it was very interesting. I really enjoyed it very much. I hope the audience enjoyed as much as, uh, as I did. And uh, thank you for coming and presenting at Semla.